Over 36 years ago, the Irish Republican Army bombed the Grand Hotel in Brighton during Conservative Party conference. Five people were killed. This was 13 years before the Good Friday Agreement finally ended the Northern Ireland Troubles, a three-decade-long conflict in which over 3,500 people died. Now, the man who bombed Brighton is called Patrick McGee. He became widely known, of course, as the Brighton Bomber. Now, I'm interviewing Patrick, who's just written his new book, Where Grieving Begins, his own memoir. It's part of two interviews, and this is very important. Patrick McGee established a friendship with an extraordinary woman named Joe Berry. Now, Joe Berry's dad, Sir Anthony Berry, was one of the five people killed in that attack. And yet she became friends for now over two decades with the man who killed her father. Now, I want to talk to both of them about their extraordinary friendship about the collaboration that they've had, because I want to learn about reconciliation, about conflict resolution, and what we can learn from their friendship. So to begin with, in the first interview, I've spoken to Patrick McGee. I've spoken to him about how he became involved in the armed struggle, whether he has regrets about the, about the loss of life, about the people he killed, and about his friendship with Joe Berry, what he's learned from that, and what we all could learn from that. Now, these are both powerful, very powerful interviews, two of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. I've learned a huge amount from these two interviews, and I think that you'll learn a lot as well. Thank you so, so much for joining us in these very turbulent times. I just want to start. It's 36 years since the Brighton bombing. It's almost as long as I was alive. It happened two months after I was born. And it's 23 years since the Good Friday Agreement formally ended the Troubles, which killed over three and a half thousand people. For a new generation, not least those younger than myself, this feels like a different historical era. I studied it at university as history, bizarrely enough. But for you, this was, this was much of your life. So I just want to start with that. You were born in Belfast. And like many Irish people before you, your family left and you grew up in large part in Norwich. So do you just want to talk, tell me a bit about that, about your family background, about the fact in the South, there was a long history, of course, of emigration, but in the North at the time, when it was under essentially one party unionist rule, it was a state that ruled indefinitely where the Catholics uh, were treated as a second class, as second class citizens, Many also left at that time. So you just want to tell me a bit about that? Well, I was born in Belfast, uh, but at the age of four, uh, dad had found work in England after the work in Belfast. He, he spent about two years working in England and then arranged for us to go over to England. And so from the age of four until I came back to uh, Belfast permanently when I was 19, uh, all my years, all my formative experiences were in uh, England. That's 15 years of my life. Tell me how you came to republicanism, because your your parents weren't politically active, were they? But you did have relatives before them who were active in the previous struggles, republican struggles. Mm -hmm. So just tell me how much that heritage mm -hmm. had an impact on you and what brought you into the republican movement. It certainly wasn't a direct uh, influence. Um, I, my parents were of an age not to be involved. Uh, and But their parents, uh, my grandparents, that generation, were heavily involved uh, in the British Army and in the, in the Republican movement. Uh, I was brought up in stories. I was aware of stories. I wouldn't say it's, it's difficult to, to, to put the right emphasis here. I was aware of these things, but it wasn't something that was talked about all the time. But I was aware, for instance, that both of my grandmothers in different parts of Belfast in Catholic ghettos would have been active and there would have been, a, 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 as it was common in many people of that generation, they would have, the women would have been carrying guns under their shawls. Uh, there were the fear of uh, uh, in the area being raided 
you know, by the, or the RUC or the, the B specials. So the guns had to be there. And it was women would have carried the guns under their shawls. It's a very common thing at, at that time. Uh, my grandfather had been in the British Army. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, uh, back in Belfast, just the start of what, what we term the pogroms. And uh, in in, uh, after partition, you know, there's a, a lot of tension, a lot of violence. And the communities uh, combined to uh, protect themselves. My father came out of the British Army. That expertise was needed. Anybody who had military training was, you know, had a choice to make. Do they get involved or they don't? My father got involved and he joined the IRA. He was interned uh, about nine months into his involvement. And uh, he, he would have spent about 20 months interned. On the other side of the family, I have uncles who were interned at the same period as my grandfather. And my and, and my uh, maternal grandfather was also involved, but wasn't uh, interned. In 1968, when you were 17 years old, the civil rights movement, uh, partly inspired and very much inspired by the US civil rights movement, uh, began protests, campaigns uh, across the North, arguing against the treatment of the Catholic minority as second-class citizens in the six mm -hmm. counties, of course, of, of the North. Um, and that escalated, and it ended, in 90, it ended up in 1969, where the B Specials, of course, who were, for those who don't know, uh, were a paramilitary organization linked to the, to the state's of the North, uh, ended, you know, Catholics were burned out of their homes, up to 5% of Catholics were burned out of their homes in, in Belfast. And in that period, it was uh, the biggest population movement in Europe since World War II. So just tell me about that impact of that particular period on your political consciousness and on the political consciousness of many other young Catholics. Well, the first thing that I would need to say is that even growing up in England, I was very conscious of who I was. I was a, I was a, I was Irish. Uh, felt a bit strange in England. Um, I always kept tabs on what was happening there. Uh, family members would come over. We would go over on holiday. I was close to it. I could move in and out of the Belfast accent very easily. You know, uh, I think I didn't have a, a full uh, Norfolk accent. My my parents still had their accents, so I felt very uh, Irish and uh, aware of that. So when things started to happen uh, in Belfast, when whatever events hit the, the news headlines, I, I was drawn to know. And so, for example, in um, 1964, we had uh, at the time of the uh, British general election, uh, the election that saw Wilson get in. Uh, there was serious rights in Belfast. Uh, so I wanted to know what was happening then. And I was also picking up at uh, what impact that was having on my parents. So clearly the North wasn't a normal place. You know, there was a, uh, there'd never been a decade without violence, without rights, without the introduction of an uh, internment. And that it was happening again in the 60s. Uh, and in 66, uh, the UVF uh, re-emerged and uh, were targeting Catholics. Uh, th there, was a, there was about three, perhaps four killings at that particular period. And uh, this was in reaction to, you know, uh, demands for civil rights and, uh, and reform of the state. Uh, when you think back at that period, particularly with the, the Labour government, then you would have hoped a national state hope that this would uh, in, uh, lead to um, greater scrutiny from Westminster. And in fact, there was contacts made up to draw um, MPs over to witness what was happening. I think I, I was reading recently that uh, James Callaghan, who as Home Secretary, actually visited the North in 19, not, not as Home Secretary, but in 1954, before you know, he was elected, in 1954 to see what was happening on the ground. So. There was awareness of what was happening there, but nobody was prepared to really deal with it. And nobody wanted to 
and it was, became a, what do you call it, a convention that Westminster did not get involved with matters uh, that were devolved, supposedly devolved. And so the unions got away with it for 50 years. They got away with discrimination in the housing and employment. And uh, uh, my parents' generation suffered from that. And as I said, it was indirectly, it was why we ended up in England, because there was no work there. And that was because of the discrimination. When the British Army were originally sent in, of course, under the Labour government, uh, because of the actions of the B-Specials and the and the Unionist state, I suppose, mm -hmm. actually many Catholics and nationalists to begin with welcomed the arrival of those troops, but that changed quite dramatically. Do you just want to tell us? Well, I, I can remember when the, the, the British troops uh, entered Belfast, which I think was on the 15th of August, 1969, it moved into Derry the day before, simply because the uh, the RUC and the B specials couldn't contain the place. Uh, so the troops were sent in to bolster up Stormont, you know. And uh, I remember the reaction to my parents. My mother uh, was delighted at this. You know, she thought of it as a positive thing. It was as if the British Army was saviors. They came in and saved possibly... Uh, Debts, you know, uh, 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 more violence. My father, though, uh, took a different view. And uh, he believed, and I don't know where his thinking came at this stage, you know, once in, you know, they're going to be there a long time and, you know, they won't always be the saviors that they, were, they held it then. And it was so true. And I remember talking to um, Republicans later on, you know, particularly in jail, who were, you know, talked about that particular period, because they're all interested in what, well, how we got to here, how we got here with the violence. And uh, there was a, a real um, feeling that the, the, the troops were solely there to prop up the state. And uh, it was seen as a means of, uh, you know, clarifying the situation. Uh, the, the, uh, things were more defined. We were in, locked in conflict directly now with the British state rather than their surrogates, the Orange Order and the Orange State. Just for those who know, who don't know some of the history, I mean, you mentioned the UVF. For those who don't know, that's the Ulster Volunteer Force, a loyalist paramilitary group. The other thing, that, just to, to move on, is particularly new generation, don't know often the difference between the official IRA and the provisional IRA. And for those who don't know, the officials had a more Marxist uh, outlook and approach and preached national liberation. And their critique of the provisionals were they were a nationalist, even sectarian uh, and anti-Marxist uh, formation. But the strategy of the officials, wasn't it, was when the in 1969 with the violence and Catholics being driven from their home, IRA equals I ran away was inscrawled on the on the walls of, of Belfast. And the provisionals who took a, a different position in terms of a military strategy filled the vacuum. I mean, I know you were attracted first to the officials. So do you just want to explain that split no. how you ended up with the uh, with uh, sorry, oh, how you ended up with the provisionals? Before the split, there was only the IRA. Uh, these other titles, the official IRA and the provisional IRA, uh, followed that split. But, uh, and so, uh, I mean, that, that split had occurred when I returned to Belfast and, uh, you know, was trying to weigh up matters. Uh, I think largely what you're saying is correct. Um, after the failure of the IRA's border campaign, which ran from about 1956 to officially ending, I think it was in 62, uh, the no uh, 59 the um the movement um decided to get more involved and agitating on the issues of the day for housing or whatever and uh, th that uh, that was the course they took the point is it didn't match the reality of what was happening on the ground in the north were in the, in that 69 year you know vital year the uh IRA were seen by the people, you know, to have failed in the defence. You know, our areas were open to attack and the IRA were not there to give protection or totally insufficient uh, uh, protection. That eventually did lead to a split. And you're talking about within months, you know, the, the movement had split. 
And so you've got a, the provisional IRA uh, broke away. Uh, they were called the provisionals because they hadn't at that uh, stage been uh, constitutionally uh, you know, um, formed. That came later. So you're talking about something to meet the issues right at the moment. You know, it had to be done then in order to defend the areas that IRA had to split because as the perceived uh, Southern leadership, you know, were um, hadn't fully grasped what was actually happening. You know, they were unprepared for it. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, when I came back to Belfast and eventually decided that, yes, the armed struggle we were engaged in was uh, the right course, I had to make the decision, you know. And I think I was initially... Uh, drawn towards the official movement. And I was aware of some of the um, labeling and caricaturing that was prevalent at the time, certainly that the media engaged in. So the provisionals were, would have been seen as green nationalists uh, and uh, painted as being sectarian. I didn't find that. In fact, I, I found that on uh, there was a sectarianism I saw from some of the officials at the time. But in the district I was, uh, uh, I initially was involved in, which was Unity Flats, which is a flashpoint area, the provisionals were, uh, I, I think, part of that community, you know, um, were that community. And it was the most natural thing, in, in, I found, to, uh, to join them. I mean, I couldn't think of what else uh, uh, I could possibly do. I, I couldn't have not joined them. Uh, it was really needed. The defense of that area was needed. So tell me about the impact of Bloody Sunday when British troops uh, opened fire on unarmed protesters and also how you got involved in the armed struggle more. So in the, I know you were based off in the Ardoyne, which is an area of Belfast, which is a particularly Republican stronghold. Um, and you saw for the first time people teaching you how to make bombs, that kind of thing. So just tell me a bit about that. Uh, you've, you've got that from the book. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, well, um, well, let me see. I joined what was called G Company of the 3rd Battalion, which was based in that area of, of Carrick Hill. Uh, uh, the 3rd Battalion covered the north of the city. So it areas like Ardoin, the New Lodge Road, um, the, the Bone, um, the, the market, short strand, they were all lumped together and called the third battalion, as opposed to the the first and second battalions, which were in the the west of the city. But uh, it's a, it was a different type of war in the north, and it was sectarian at times. You know, I think most of the killings that time was a it was happening in the north of the city, and it was a real battleground, particularly in areas like the 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 New Lodge Road and Ardoin, they were, you know, real hot spots. And uh, I, I joined in, in the unit in Unity Flats and uh, was involved in that 3rd Battalion. And for um, probably not that long before I was interned, actually, there was such a, a rate of attrition, that, you know, and uh, that uh, nobody really survived very long, you know. Uh, constant churn over people being arrested, people having to go on the run, people being killed, you know. And you you uh, bound yourself suddenly in positions of authority, you know, well beyond uh, your, your your capability and experience. And But that was the picture throughout the movement of that time. Again, I, I use that phrase, it was the attrition rate, you know. the And, and your survival, your function at a survival level, you know, uh, trend, uh, Keep the movement going, keep the resistance going, and and that, and that was our that was our communities resisting, you know, basically an occupation, and I would describe it as an occupation. Um, There's in propaganda, literally in the um, uh, area where I uh, was involved in uh, Unity Flats, which only had about um, three hundred and five six uh, houses flats. Residences. Uh, there would have been a Sanger, a British Army permanent Sanger, you know, at the front of the flats. There would have been constant patrols in it, two patrols at any given time, you know, uh, you know, working their way through the area. Um, just um, south 
of the floods, there was a an RUC barracks straight across the road from us, an RUC barracks. At the north of us was a British Army uh, barracks. Uh, uh, and uh, about half a mile away was the main British Army barracks, uh, Girdwood barracks in the, in the north of the city. There was also another Sanger on top of literally the library, which was, we were very, we were right beside the city centre. So Central Library had a, a Sanger on the top, which could monitor movements in the approaches to, to the area. So I, uh, I can't think of a more apt term than, you know, occupation. That's what it felt like anyway. Before I ask you just about when you were first detained and then, of course, moving on to Brighton, um, and I should point out what I'm about to ask you, this isn't something you were involved in whatsoever, but it just want to just see what how you would reflect on this now. As you say, the position of the IRA was this this is an occupate the British occupation, and there's no question as well there were atrocities committed by the British state, notably, most notably Bloody Sunday, and also by loyalist paramilitaries who murdered innocent Catholic civilians. And we know, of course, about uh, collusion between the British security services and lawyers paramilitaries, not one striking example being the murder of the Belfast solicitor, Pat Finnegan. But it was not, was it not the case that the IRA themselves engaged in sectarian atrocities? One example, the Kings Mill massacre, when 11 Protestant workmen on a minibus taken out all of them shot. There was a single Catholic man on the minibus who was allowed to go free. At the time, it was the South Armagh Republican Action Force who claimed responsibility, but since the historical inquiries team has made it clear it was the provisional IRA, despite the fact they were on ceasefire. And not only were these sectarian attacks horrific and indefensible in, in any sense, but they also escalated a tit-for-tat sectarian war and in no sense advanced a struggle against what was seen and felt to be an occupation by so many nationalists and Catholics in, in the mm. North and prevented any possibility of a section of the Protestant working class being won over to a United Ireland. I mean, would you look back at those atrocities and think they were just unforgivable and wrong? Mm. Well, well, certainly, yes, I, I, I'm totally opposed to sectarianism and any actions that the Republicans carried out of that nature always, never mind morally wrong, but they held us back, they set us back. So it couldn't be justified, and and you 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 mentioned some there, but I I feel that the you're not given a, a true um, representation of what was happening on the ground. Republican violence, very in large, when it was involved in sectarianism, and it was at certain times at the early days, was in reaction reaction to what was happening in the district, particularly from um, attacks by loyalism, which as part of course. Would have tackled, would have attacked Catholics, the Catholic nationalist communities. They didn't. They literally didn't uh, engage with us. They they felt that by um, killing Catholics, that would put pressure on us. There would be uh, an outcry within our district, our districts to desist the armed struggle. That never happened. You know that never happened. But uh, unfortunately we fell into the trap of often reacting to that and and also it must be borne in mind that the british state itself actively promoted that i think uh, they uh, they facilitated uh, the um through collusion you know attacks on our districts from loyalists and at some points we're actually actively organizing them you think of the mrf etc people had turned and were trained and, and and that includes nationalists too, you know, to stir up sectarianism. But when the movement uh, never officially sanctioned, never at any time officially sanctioned, but when Republicans, for whatever reason, uh, resorted to sectarian attacks, etc., it all was set us back and cannot be cannot be justified. Do you think in that period there could have been a different strategy, one which would have attempted to win over, for example, Protestant workers, rather than? what actually happened was much of the, the Protestant working class ever more went into the fold of the most reactionary unionists in response to what was happening. I, 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 my feeling, my sense is that the, the Protestant population in large part of, you know, uh, of the, uh, divorced from the sort of like the poor 
lawless areas, you know, uh, didn't engage. And but lo uh, I think people don't perceive that there's a you know people talk these days about civic unionism. I think it always did exist, but it didn't engage. And you, in fact, you found that many people who didn't uh, from a Protestant background who uh, didn't agree with what the loyalists were doing or what the union state was doing would have left, to be honest. Uh, in the middle of the conflict, it was very, very difficult to engage with the Protestant communities. Extremely difficult. Uh, the, the sectarianism had been whipped up from their own leadership. What were the platforms for to do it? There was no politics to speak of. It took us years to um, gain the strength uh, in, in order to uh, engage with our, our erstwhile enemies and with the, the people we were uh, opposed to, you know, ideologically. Uh, that couldn't have happened in the middle of that conflict. It was just there was no outlets to engage with ordinary working class Protestants. On, just terrible, but that's that's the way uh, I re remember it then. Um, I, the, the two communities were so split, so split and ghettoized and suspicious of each other that all reason seemed to go out the window. Uh, now there, there, there's much more scope for that, and that's got to be uh, the direction we all take. You know, we have to break down, you know, the the, the misperceptions we have of each other, and and properly engage. And the active engagement itself is a contribution to that. You know, the contact of itself breaks down some of these barriers and cuts through the labelling. Yeah, but in the middle of that conflict, that w just was not possible. Now you were detained in 1973. The annual commemoration, the day of of Wolf Tone, who's seen as the founding father of modern Irish republicanism. He, for those who don't know, was was actually himself a Protestant, which itself is 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 itself interesting. Do you want to tell me, in terms of just forward going forward, the hunger strikes? Uh, obviously, many people watching this, the name they'll be most familiar with is Bobby Sands, but of course there were many others. Just tell me about briefly the context of the hunger strikes, but the impact that had on nationalist communities in the North? Well, in the run-up to the ending of internment, the, the British state was already gearing up for the, their next phase. And their next phase, they didn't have internment, their next phase was they needed to, from their perspective, to, you know, to... Uh, um, have lock up nationalists, to lock up Republicans. Their next phase was to criminalize us, you know, to criminalize the Republican movement. And they did that by removing what up to then had been a certain level of political recognition, you know, in, in, in the prisons. And so from a, like a, a date, I think, I can't remember what it was now, the 31st of March, uh, 1976, anybody arrested after that date was treated as a, as a, as a criminal. We no longer had a prisoner of war status. And uh, I, as I have ever done in history, Republicans resisted being criminalized. You know, uh, their struggle was a political struggle. You know, they'd engage with the enemy, and but when uh, captured were treated as, as uh, criminals rather than political prisoners. They're bound to resist that. That resistance in the prison eventually led to the hunger strikes. It was a concerted effort on the state to criminalize the prisoners and through the prisoners our struggle. The prisoners resisted and eventually it ended up. They engaged in the hunger strike and, and 10, uh, 10 of our prisoners died on that, on that hunger strike. There were another two deaths. One celebrated quite recently, Frank Stagg, uh, died, I think it was in 1972. And uh, Michael Gahan died in 1974. And they're all, there's been a long history of hunger strikes to resist criminalization uh, by Republicans. In 1984, Britain was in a period of quite dramatic tumult. It was in the midst of the miners' strike, which was uh, the, which was which went on for a year. Um, and in uh, in the autumn of uh, of 1984, the Conservatives had their annual conference in, in Brighton. Oh, 84, yes, yes. Yeah, 84. Now, as you wrote about it, you wrote it was more than a revenge attack for the hunger strikers' deaths and the deaths of those killed by the British state as part of its terror campaign. 
the British military and their political masters were in pursuance of strategic containment. Uh, that is, they were happy to settle for decades of bombs in Belfast, remote from the domestic agenda. And you wrote that their strategy was to keep the whole conflict out of sight as achievable, uh, hoping to ensure it remained largely off the front pages and television screens of the British public. And there was a cross, cosy cross-party consensus, which she thought would continue. Is it fair to say then that the main aim of the bombing of Conservative Party conference in Brighton was to make the conflict front page news um, in Britain? Yes, but I would expand on that and say that Brighton, you know, uh, never mind the significance of that specific operation, it, it was part of a campaign. It, one bomb wouldn't have done it. Uh, if we uh, were going to uh, eventually lead to negotiations, we we had to be you know sustain sustain that campaign, uh, it, and it took a, a long time. I mean, there was, the the bombing camp in England, England had uh, been going on for years, but had been stopgap, stopgap. Not the type of pressure that would eventually lead the British state to take us sufficiently serious to engage with us and negotiate. I, I I think as a consequence of the um, the bombing the, on the, the target of the Grand Central Hotel, and and uh, I, I I think as a consequence uh, of that, more in the movement was con were convinced that in terms of military, you know, this was the, the this was where more resources had to be you know directed, and. Uh, and but it took us. It took even then after after uh, our arrest. It took quite a while, a few years before the movement uh, really um, was able to build up a sustainable campaign. And I think it did. I think it did eventually force the British to engage with us. I mean, before we talk about questions of morality and ethics, which people will will want to hear, so it's important. Mm -hmm. It's important I put them to you. Of Don't course. you think that? You know, the criti one critique of individual terror would be that, uh, on its uh, on its own terms, that is. So I'll I'll talk about morality and ethics. Is that the response of a state to individual terror is to clamp down further on civil liberties and to use it as justification and rationale for clamping down ever harder, including on those who aren't combatants, those civil liberties of of innocent nationalist Catholics in the north and that would always be the inevitable consequences that not only would people die in that hotel but innocent catholics and nationalists would themselves feel the full force of the british state in response uh, this is the way i look at it i look at it in terms of the power who had the power and what we found is that the british state had the power i mean we could, you couldn't compare our resources our resources was really what our communities could, you know, contrive in its defence. The British state had all this power, but instead of when you, if you've got power, there's certain responsibility there. But instead of looking at options, the British decided that violence itself was the answer. That's a Republicans' understanding of how Britain treated Ireland and treated us. If we had the power. If we had uh, more power, we wouldn't have had to engage in armed struggle. Simple as that. We didn't have uh, political power. We had no means of uh, um, being heard, our grievances being heard and arguing you know, for the reforms that were needed. Uh, at, and all the uh, normal means of uh, uh, raising our concerns and our grievances, you know, for the constitutional, extra constitutional means, like, marches, demonstrations, forming alliances, getting outside people to see what was happening. They were all tried and weren't sufficient to the point. And remember, we were also being physically, we were physically under attack. We, uh, we were weak and we had to go to war. And it was a remarkable, I think, it's remarkable that despite all of that, we managed to build politically and develop in our communities, and our community supported us sufficiently to carry the day. Uh, this, see the arguments about the morality of conflict, etc. Nobody seems to direct those questions to the British state, who had all the power, 
and therefore more options, but chose violence. We hadn't the options. We only had violence, and it was violence that was uh, in, involved in defensive uh, reasons. We we had to defend ourselves. Well, I should say, I mean, I do pose those questions, and I've repeatedly publicly spoken out about the you know, whether it be collusion and the atrocities such as Bloody Sunday, horrific atrocities. But obviously in this conversation, we're talking about yourself. Uh, sure. And also talking about the wider... I'm community. not directing it to you. Uh, no, 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 I get that. I was just just, just to clarify, because that's why it's important. So mm-hmm. in terms of... And, and also it's important to answer what people... Uh, to, to pose what I know will be on lots of people's minds. Now, now, you wrote, we wanted to lessen as far as possible the likelihood of injury to hotel staff. The device was timed, therefore, to go off when staff were less likely to be present. But there was simply no guarantee that staff working a late shift in the bar and reception areas would escape the impact of the blast. At the time, I would have considered all those attending the conference to be Tory warmongers and therefore legitimate targets. I suppose my question is, is that how you still think? And also, in the build-up, despite the fact you say, try to minimise that, as you recognise you can't in practice, that people who work in hotels include cleaners on poverty pay, restaurant bar workers on poverty pay, working class local people in Brighton who yep. who may well have hated the Conservatives or not voted for them, but certainly weren't part in any sense of what was happening in the north of Ireland. Did you think in advance any sense of horror that innocent, that people, even you would accept, obviously were innocent, would die? And how did you feel about that? But also... Do you still think all those attending were legitimate targets? Is that still how you feel? Because you say at the time, and I don't know how you feel today. Mm. Well, there's one thing to, to say, if you put it into sort of a context, you're talking in a context of a, of, of a conflict. And in that context, context, you do, I think, operate on a, re- a reduced view of those you're in conflict with. I think it's, uh, that's common to all conflict, you know, the, the labeling takes over. You, know, you don't see beyond the uh, color of their uniform or their political allegiances, etc. Uh, so much is lost in conflict. But I would say that we were very conscious uh, uh, of uh, that there would be hotel staff there, innocent people in that hotel. We're very conscious of that. Our, our campaign, etc., was n- was not directed at the ordinary uh, working class people of, of England or anywhere. You know. We were trying to target those we felt most culpable for British state terrorism, what was happening on our streets. The, the, the use of murder, the collusion in the murder gangs, the torture, the killing of children with plastic bullets, all this was happening. And uh, we, we had to do something to stop that. Uh, but uh, we are, I mean, you talk about the hunger strike. Uh, I, I can remember um, a delegation of, uh, well, it's not a delegation, that's the wrong word, isn't it? It was, it was a group of women, uh, you know, wives and, uh, uh, and mothers of uh, strike and minors would have come over to Dublin and they would have been in our club and we'd have, you know, so we were conscious of it, things like that, that we, we felt a fraternity with what was happening with the English working class at that particular time. And I can remember even being on the ground during the time I was active in England, being a witness to, for instance, you know, the cardboard jungles. You know, the, um, this generation probably doesn't even know what that means. But, uh, you know, the, the level of deprivation and you know, lack of housing and people living rough on the streets, you know, it was, it was shocking to see then. So we were aware of that. But as I said, a lot of your thinking does, I, this applies to all sides of a conflict, does, um, is reduced, you know, because of the very nature of that conflict. So when we targeted uh, Brighton, we were aware, and we didn't. We wanted to prevent as far as possible, uh, you know, any injuries to, vil- to civilians. That's why we timed the bomb to go off at, uh, before three o'clock in the morning. When we reasoned that there would be less likelihood of civilian staff in the hotel, but of course we couldn't guarantee there wouldn't be. And I think on the night, uh, the, the proceedings there, there was. Um, a, bars downstairs that were closing up, but there would have been uh, some civilian staff in the building. But when you think about it, we had all the people we felt most culpable for what was happening. They're present in the one area. It's, it was a natural target for us. 
when the bomb went off, you you say you felt immediate relief as an operator. Oh, no, I know it'll be shocking for people to hear, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, do you want to just unpack that? Why, you know, did you at any point at that period, I mean, you went, you hit Cork City back in, mm. over, over in the Republic in, in Cork City. Uh, you had a Guinness in front of you. Uh, you listened to the reaction of punters around you. Did you think at any moment, my God, because of this bomb that I've planted, innocent people are now dead and many others are horribly injured and will suffer life-changing injuries for the rest of your life. Was any of that there? Did you think that? When I read about this in the book, um, I'm trying to convey what I felt immediately on hearing of it. And this was a very prestigious target. Um, it was down to me. I would have been the, the, you know, the person planting the bomb. You know, if it had failed, you know, there would have been repercussions for me. And for the movement, because this was a very stra strategic act. And uh, so just immediately relief in terms of, of the technician that had gone off. That's what I meant. But obviously other feelings then asserted themselves, you know, afterwards. And I, I describe, for example, um, being in a bar uh, later and seeing the, the footage of, uh, you know, people being rescued from the bombing after the bombing and, you know, trying to gauge, you know, feelings as people witnessed this on the TV. And then I remember like a process of thought, you know, that, you know, I was so committed to the, the struggle, you know, and, uh, and that I'd all, it was with near certainty if I'd have been, I'd been on the run for a number of years, if I'd been arrested, I would have faced at least 20 years in jail at that point. But then I, I did recognize that, you know, the, you know, the British state would pull out all stops to apprehend the, those they uh, uh, um, found out were, were responsible. And uh, so that, that's, a, that's a, you know, that's a sobering moment. You know, you, you have, it's a, it's a new dimension, you know, to, you know, the, what you're facing into the future. But it didn't uh, stop me from being committed to the strategy of taking the war to England. And from a very um, early point in my involvement in the Republican movement, I was aware that, you know, this was only going two ways, you know, and this was drummed into every recruit into the Republican movement, you know. Capture, you go on the run, or you're going down a hole in the ground, you know. There's, there's your options, you know. And so, I mean, that's not going to stop you. That wouldn't stop you. It didn't stop me anyway. Do you have regrets about the bombing? Would you, I mean, would you still now, would you, if you went back in time, would you do the same thing? See, I, um, look, you can play these mind games and mind experiments, but Brighton would have happened whether I was involved or not, you know, the, the, that's, a, that's one fact. Um, do I, re re there's many things I regret about that conflict, but the one thing I can, I, I can't say, I think our actions were justified. Uh, given the imbalance in resources at our disposal compared to what the state had in its arsenal, you know, and we felt the brunt of it, our people felt the brunt of it. Uh, we had no other options in it. Um, I have regrets, you know, something I regret every death. Some people, you hear some people making the statement, I regret the loss of innocent lives. Uh, they don't talk about the people that were culpable. I regret all those deaths. I wish uh, nobody had died in that conflict. I wish there hadn't have been violence. I wish we didn't have to go to war. You would, you were captured by the British in, uh, by the British authorities, I should say, in Glasgow uh, in June 1985. Um, and in 1986, you received eight life sentences. And as you write in the book, the judge branded you a man of exceptional cruelty and inhumanity. When you heard those words, what did you, what did you think? be perfectly honest, I didn't take them uh, too seriously. Um, that was part of the script, you know. The, um, they're going to demonize you. You are demonized. You know, if you're a Republican, you're demonized. The, but when you think about it, uh, the, no evidence was given in court into my mental state or all of that. Nothing. And I didn't participate in it. You know, I pleaded not guilty and left it at that for the, my defense to, you know, to, to handle the case. 
so uh, this judgment has been made about me, you know, as it's made about uh, anybody from a, a struggle who, you know, stood in the dock. They all tarred with the same brush, basically. So I, I, I would have been a bit dismissive of it. You met when you were released. You were in prison for fif uh, for fifteen years, um, which is a, a, a very long. So you were released in in August two thousand. Is that right? Yeah, and no, you... no, ninety nine. Ah, ninety nine. Sorry, forgive me. Um, and then you met Joe Berry for the first time on the twenty fourth of November two thousand. You write very movingly, I have to say, about meeting with her. It's extremely <laughs> moving recollection. Tell me how you felt before you met her, because it's a big mm. moment. Mm. Well, uh, Anita said I'd uh, seen a bit that uh, I had heard in the summer that somebody connected who had uh, with Brayden, somebody who had lost a relative in Brayden, wanted to see me. And uh, I'd already on the, uh, the main track that this is something that we should do as Republicans. You know, we'd caused this pain and this hurt. We somehow uh, had to deal with that, you know. Dealing with the, the, the nowadays we talk about the legacy issues. One of the big legacy issues is the victims, victims of our actions. So I think there is a a, com, a compunction us to deal with that, and that meant meeting victims. So I, I was ready for that. But then you, there's an arrangement meet, and you're on the threshold of seeing somebody who you've hurt. In this instance, I was going to be seeing a woman, and I killed her father. So I, I, right on the doorstep of going in and seeing this woman, I think it, the, the full, the, the, um, the enormity of that uh, just hit me, you know. And beforehand, you know, I'd sought and received some assurances that this this woman only wanted to try and put her father's death in the context. So I was there as a Republican responsible. I would try to explain our motivation, set it in the context, hoping that that at some level would help you're not trying to do further harm. You're trying to help here. But then I'm thinking, God, if, if, uh, if I was about to meet somebody who'd killed a relative belong to me, you know, how might I react? No matter what I've seen, the, the need for this, how might I react in the heat of the moment? You know, and I have to say, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I really do not know how to answer that. But when I met Joe, uh, Joe Barry, and I, I killed her father, uh, Sir Anthony Barry, uh, a Tory MP, I, I got no sense at all of animosity, just a, like a searching question and wanting to know, you know, and that was a, extremely powerful. I mean, she read a poem to you, and in that poem she said, now I stand alone with you who killed my dad. What was it like to hear when, when she read that poem? Well, you, you know, you can imagine I was listening very attentively, um, and the poem itself seemed to prefigure her actual meeting and she'd written that poem I think it was some six months before actually meeting me clearly she's given a long a lot of thought to this she had a, a expectations of it and I think she read it because it seemed to fulfill her expectations um, uh, so that's I, I didn't realize this I didn't have the words then to understand this but uh, she wouldn't have read that poem to me if she thought for one moment that uh, I would reject it or, you know, wouldn't be sensitive to the message of it. Uh, but the very fact that she read it and took time to read it, you know, was an important moment for me, you know, and I think back at that, you know. And the incredible thing is now that meeting, that meeting happened in uh, November, November the 24th, 2000. We're still meeting. I was talking to Joe last night on the phone. It's incredible, isn't it? You know, like all these years later, there's still a willingness to engage with me and the and the deal of the you know the past. I mean that relationship you you and Joe have established is remarkable. It's really remarkable. I mean what what does it teach all of us? What 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 should we learn from that? Well I tried to make sense of it at the time. You know, it was it was meant to be just a one-off meeting. And but then we went away and thought deeply about it. And there was a real need for me to continue that conversation. What I didn't appreciate was Joe was feeling the same. She wanted to continue it, and we did meet some, I think it was two weeks after that. And I've, been, I've met on more than 200 occasions, I've lost count since then. But what we did find in the, in the course of, you know, of, of our dialogue was that we, it wasn't unique. It was unusual, but it was not unique. And uh, there, there was a, was a, was a, was a brilliant uh, uh, organization called you know, um, uh, 
a, a brilliant initiative uh, called the Forgiveness Project. And uh, the journalists involved, Maria Kantaki, you know, a London journalist, collated stories from war zones around the world, and dozens of these, it's run into more than 100, of similar uh, uh, meetings between victims and they'd be like offenders or perpetrators. And uh, just, you know, you, you, you collate these stories and they're, they're all different, but they all have this common thing that people are trying to understand, you know, and reaching out. And uh, so it was a big thing to find that out. You know, this wasn't unique. You know, others have gone through uh, similar, you know, uh, lanes of thought. And so it's it's something very human, I think. Um, you, after like massive trauma, as we get in conflict, you know, there's a, a need to repair, to heal some way. And that, and that can involve difficult conversations. No more difficult than somebody meeting uh, uh, the daughter of somebody you've killed, you know, and uh, you want to, you, you want uh, others to understand it. You're trying to understand it yourself, but you want others to examine it too. Hopefully they may come up with uh, a better understanding of it than you. You realize this is something necessary and it could be good. You're hoping it's an example. You're hoping that others would be encouraged to, you know, take a, a step towards reaching out and perhaps understanding those who beforehand have caused them hurt or who they were perceived as being an enemy, you know. It's such a, uh, the real sadness, the real sadness is this process of thought comes after conflict, you know. You'd love to think there was a means of doing that before you reach the stage of conflict. You could, you could sit out and go beyond the labels and go on uh, beyond all the things that keep us apart, if you could break down those barriers and engage in proper dialogue. You know, I, I go back to an earlier point. There's people with power that went out of their way to prevent that, to understand them. And just, just last couple of things. With Joe, I mean, as you say, you don't know how you'd respond. I don't know how I'd respond either. No, you know? no. We'd all like to think. Yeah, well, exactly. Why do you think Joe, how do you understand Joe's response? Oh, she's a remarkable woman, let me say that. Uh, but what's even more remarkable is the realisation that she started on this on this course very soon after her father's death, within, I think within months. Um, and so there was some preparation, you could say, there was decades of thinking about it. You know, before it happened, she, she, uh, I didn't. I've never heard of Joe Barry, honestly. Um, in jail, you'd have thought I might have picked up because she, she went public uh, at a very early stage, going back to about uh, eighty six uh, or eighty five, maybe even, saying that one day she would like to meet those who'd killed her father. Remarkable statement at the time, you know. And but she made it happen. It's uh, it is remarkable. Uh, and Joe would say the same, you know, she, I think she would say that she just hopes that uh, it might encourage others. What, what emotions does Joe's response give give you? Oh, it's, oh, it's powerful. Um, and particularly in the moment of that first meeting, uh, it's incredible to think now that our very first meeting that took place in Dublin, as I said, in late uh, 2000, we, we actually sat alone and talked for three hours you know and there's no concept of time when it was happening it just kind of came to a conclusion there's no enough and more we could say in the moment but uh, that dialogue lasted three hours and uh, there was there was, a, there was a, i went there um as i said with, with uh, the conviction that we needed to do this that we needed to sit and try and explain our motivations and put the our actions into a context. Um, but in the very fact of talking to somebody you've hurt, you know, uh, 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 the enormity of that can just uh, overwhelm you. And I think it did. I mean, there was a point when I just couldn't continue the conversation in that vein, you know, with that political hat on, trying to justify, you know, trying to do it with some 
sensitivity, but still, you know, what you're doing is explaining the thing from your perspective, and that's a justification. Very difficult for your, your uh, Joe to have uh, had to listen to that. It come a time, then you know the, the words left me, and I, I think Joe recognizes that. And a new conversation began after that point, a more questioned conversation, and then and, um, some some conclusions. You know, um, one a major one was one of the initial ones. And it's very important that even though I was prepared to meet and I thought I was, uh, you know, uh, my thinking was wide enough to do this, I hadn't appreciated the extent that I had been laboring under this kind of uh, reduced view of those people we're in conflict with. Yeah. As I'm saying, in the middle of conflict, you you, you can't perceive the, your enemy in its full humanity, or you couldn't do. You know, you go back to that question, if I had a, would I, you know, uh, uh, my feelings about Brighton now and, and you know, the, the violence. I mean, if you'd have known the people in that hotel, you couldn't have done it. You couldn't have done it, you know. And that, go back, with, doesn't mean to say it wouldn't have happened. But I couldn't have done it. I don't think, uh, I think that's a, a universal. Uh, if you know somebody, you, you couldn't do it. So you, you operate under this reduced view. You know, you're, all you see, as again, is it, this is the Tories, in conference, they're the people responsible. So you've reduced them to that sentence. If you, and that's, that's sufficient for you to act. If you'd have known more, you know, if you'd have known more, if you'd have seen them in their fullness of their humanity as individuals, it becomes nearly impossible, doesn't it? I think so. There's a lesson there. You know, the more contact with people, the more uh, um, Avenues for dialogue, etc. The less likelihood is that you your your response to grievances, etc., and differences will be balanced. I keep on going back to another point, though. The state, with all its resources, chose violence as a first option in many instances in regards to that conflict. Very finally, um, and people want me to put this to you, so it's important I do. Um, do you think in hindsight, if there'd been a strategy of, for example, peaceful mass civil disobedience, mass strikes, mass direct action, which could have made the North ungovernable, that could have been a better strategy with less of an impact on human life? And finally, do you think a United Ireland is now possible through the peaceful means? Hmm. Well, um, in, in, in regards to whether there were other options and other avenues that could have been pursued in the early days, you got first thing I'd say is it was a time of absolute flux and danger and uh, attrition. Maybe not all the best thinking was going on, you know, but I would say this, I can't, looking back on that time, see how we could have done it any differently. I'd say there was, there was undoubtedly... Um, You'd have, you'd have said there was opportunities where more could have been done. I'll give you an example. Um, I think that, again, I think if, if uh, the British political establishment had taken full responsibility for what they had created in the six counties, if Stormont had pr been prorogued, for example, and it, it was on the table in 69, maybe things might have been different. I... Got my gut, re my gut feeling on this. My gut feeling on this, and I'd love to be persuaded otherwise, is that the Orange State and the Orange Order were irreformable. They were irreformable, and they were dug their heels in. Even in this present political dispensation, where you know because of demographic changes, etc., you know it looks more likely that uh, there will be a referendum and an eventual. You, you, unity there are those who are resistant to it you know they're resistant to it i think the, there's a less of a level of resistance now than there was then demographic change is one factor in that but there was resistance to it i don't think anything even the proroguing of stormont in 69 would have uh, would have stopped the, uh, you know the descent into violence from the state in regards to united ireland so I'm not a nationalist. As simple as I'm not a nationalist. Um, I, I don't think in some sort of narrow nationalist view. You see, whatever um, 
politics comes out of this. It has to be agreed between everybody living on that island, you know, in, in Ireland. Um, if I was to say one thing to, to um, unionists are fearful of the future, I would say uh, take ownership. There's going to be change. That's inevitable. Take ownership of that change and fight your corner with all your genius. Fight it and uh, get the best deal for yourselves. See, Republicans, they are absolutely open to that. They want to create an island together, you know, with unionists. And I don't think um, it would uh, impact it in one iota in their sense of Britishness, etc. That should be protected, to be honest. There's so many links with these countries. Why wouldn't you ensure that their sense of Britishness was protected? You know, I think the, the, I think uh, Republicanism would be very open to coming at accommodation that everybody could be happy with. But you have to get you have to start that dialogue. There's resistance to it. It's happening despite that resistance. Uh, you know, and uh, more is needed. But for again, I think uh, unionism. You can call it civic unionism, but unionism should fully engage and take ownership of that process of dialogue. Pat McGee, thank you so much for joining us. And obviously, in far greater detail, you go into so many of these themes in in Where Grieving Begins, mm -hmm. uh, Plato and our publishing. But thank you so much for uh, for joining for joining us and for your candid answers to the questions that I put. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.